Welcome to Nutrition 6 Digestive System. So we're going to go through uh, the digestive systems of the different species of animals that we deal with and uh, just touch on uh, different nutrient requirements for those different species. Now digestion of feedstuffs uh, includes the physical, the uh, mainly chewing, but we also get physical churning and churning of the food in the digestive tract. The chemical breakdown and hydrochloric acid in the stomach would be the main thing there, but mainly this food is broken down by enzymatic enzymes that are secreted into the stomach and small intestine to uh, break down that feedstuffs. So digestion is more than just chewing and the food passing through the uh, uh, digestive tract. There's quite a bit going on as far as the chemicals and enzymes to break down that food stuff. Now we're going to start off illustrating the pig uh, monogastric stomach, means uh, a single, uh, simple stomach animal. The digestive system in the pig is very much like humans uh, with some ex exceptions. So as you look at this diagram here, can you think of any way that uh, pigs may be different than humans? Alright, so pigs have a cecum. And in that cecum we can get some fermentation of uh, fiber that takes place. And we can actually have pigs on a pasture-based system where they can get quite a bit of their nutrients uh, from the forages on that pasture. And if they are on a high-fiber diet, the cecum develops further so that they uh, do get energy from that fiber. Now in humans, uh, we have an appendix and it's right at the junction of the small intestine and large intestine. So that's uh, kind of one big difference. Another difference is that uh, pigs have stronger uh, chewing muscles and stronger teeth. So pigs can uh, eat uh, much uh, harder material like uh, kernels of corn than uh, we can do. Uh, another difference in pigs is that they can uh, eat some feedstuffs that you or I might consider very gross and uh, consume it and and also not get sick from uh, feedstuffs that may be uh, fairly contaminated with uh, bacteria. Well there's a lot of information on this slide and I don't expect people to uh, memorize all this but uh, it wouldn't be a bad idea to maybe make yourself a chart so that you can take some of this information to the uh, exam. So the first enzyme, amylase. Now it's uh, secreting the saliva, but a very small amount. Uh, so I'm not sure, relative to evolution, why this happened, because your pancreas is going to secrete uh, higher amounts of amylase into the small intestine where most starch uh, is uh, digested. But uh, small amount of amylase in the uh, saliva in your mouth to kind of get the digestion of the starches uh, started. And the real digestion is going to start in your stomach or the pig's stomach and enzyme uh, pepsin break down the protein into uh, peptides, small amino acid uh, chains. Hydrochloric acid is important to activate the pepsin and also uh, denatures the protein so it's more easily digested. But may, mainly your digestion is going to occur in the small intestine. So you have the pancreas that's secreting these uh, enzymes. The pancreas is secreting the uh, enzymes into the small intestine. So amylase for the starch, lipase for the fats, trypsin, helps break down proteins in addition to the pepsin back there. Chymotrypsin breaks down to the pep peptides and to the individual amino acids that are easily absorbed into the bloodstream. 
The small intestine is uh, divided into three compartments. The first compartment is the duodenum or the duodenum. Both pronunciations are correct. The du duodenum uh, produces uh, these uh, four enzymes. So peptidase, again to break down those proteins further into individual amino acids. And then we have the enzymes that are going to break and be breaking down the sugars into uh, individual monosaccharides that can be absorbed and utilized by the body. In addition to the previous chart, we have the liver producing bile. And the bile is stored in the gallbladder until our, until our digestive systems uh, need the bile. So the bile emulsifies the fats, make them digest uh, more, make them more digestible. It also neutralizes the acids from the stomach. So the stomach is going to be, have a pH around uh, 3.5. Well, we want the pH in the small intestine to be a lot more neutral. So we've got the bile to neutralize the acids. And bile also contains minerals that help with uh, digestion. And then we'll start with the uh, rumats, polygastric. And basically, stomach, uh, cows still have one stomach, but we've got multiple compartments with uh, different functions. And ruminants not only include cattle, but sheep, goats, elk, deer, bison. There's uh, very many species that uh, are uh, ruminants. For that uh, ruminant to uh, rumen to remain healthy, we do need uh, a certain amount of fiber in the diet. So here we have the anatomy of that uh, ruminant. B stuff goes down the esophagus, goes into the rumen, a huge ferment fermentation fat. Uh, some of the food is regurgitated back up and rechewed. We call that uh, the cow chewing its cud. And a cow will spend about nine hours a day uh, chewing its cud. As the particle size gets smaller, it uh, makes its way into the old mason. And the old mason appears like a basketball between the rumen reticulum old mason, and then we get into the abel mason, or true stomach. So the abel mason is like your stomach and the pig stomach. It secretes pepsin and hydrochloric acid. And then we'll go into the small intestine, large intestine, and out we go. Now there are advantages and disadvantages to the uh, rumen system. So definitely some advantages here, uh, digest uh, cellulose. Ruminants uh, tend to be vegetarians. Uh, you know, they eat uh, plant material relatively high in fiber. They can also utilize non-protein nitrogen. So uh, you need protein, you need, need amino acids, but the microbes can actually take a substance like urea or an ammonia, uh, ammonia and convert it into uh, microbial protein, which the cows can utilize. The microsynthesize the B vitamins. So why aren't all animals uh, ruminants? Well, there are some disadvantages here. Less efficient for low fiber feeds. So they can efficiently utilize the fibrous feeds, but uh, if uh, we're fermenting starch or sugars, well, we have an extra step here because the animals could uh, digest the starch and sugars just fine without the fermentation taking place. So those microbes are going to ferment starch and sugars. Uh, we're going to have some methane released, which is an energy loss into the atmosphere. And there's also a heat produced. Uh, cows produce more heat in that fermentation process than... Uh, a non ruminant would. A uh, good thing to remember with uh, ruminants is that we're not only feeding the animal, we're feeding the microbes.
And there's different species of bacteria and microbes that digest starch versus fiber uh, versus fat. So we have to make sure we uh, make any uh, ration uh, changes. Uh, do them. Uh, do it slowly. Don't do a lot all at once. Don't go from a high fiber diet to a low fiber diet over once over a day's time. Uh, do that over a week's time so the microbes can uh, adjust so that you don't have digestive upsets. And any time you're uh, feeding a ruminant uh, a low fiber diet, you've got to be careful about uh, digestive upsets because the rumen likes fiber. Okay, another disadvantage, you got that large fermentation vat uh, that the animals are carrying around every day and uh, uh, that's why cows kind of evolved uh, out on the prairie out there. They'd uh, eat a lot of feed quickly and then they'd find a place to hide, uh, lay down, rechew their cud uh, at their leisurely pace. This slide illustrates energy digestion in the rumen. So here we have our carbohydrates. The microbes take those carbohydrates and break it down to your simple sugar molecule glucose and then further break it down into your volatile fatty acids, propionic, acetate, and butyrate. Volatile fatty acids, very small compounds, they get absorbed through the rumen wall into the bloodstream. And uh, some of those volatile fatty acids will travel to, travel to the liver and the liver converts the VFAs back to glucose, which can be used for production or the glucose can be converted to fat and stored in the body. Now if it's a lactating animal, uh, acetate, is an excellent precursor for milk fat. So the mammary system will change that acetate into milk fat. Now, uh, so this is digestion. Some will be bypassed. So we don't get a 100% digestion of the fiber, starches, and sugars. Some will go into the abomasum, and if we get starches or sugars there, it'll be digested, digested just like it was in the pig. Okay, fats, uh, they can be, uh, the triglycerides can be broken down into the glycerol and the uh, fatty acids. So as I said, the uh, fats are broken down into glycerol and the fatty acids. Glycerol can be utilized for energy as, as well as the fatty acids. Uh, and uh, these fatty acids, if they're not saturated, the uh, microbes will generally saturate them, add additional hydrogens uh, to those carbons. But one thing about fats is that in general, the microbes in the rumen really don't uh, like fats that well. So generally for ruminant diets, we want to limit the amount of fat in the diet to maybe no more than 6%. Well, protein digestion in the rumen is maybe even a little more complicated than the energy digestion. So here we have a protein and, and maybe some non-protein nitrogen in our feedstuff. So here's the protein coming in. And on average, in a ruminant's diet, probably about 60% of that protein is broken down in the rumen. And 40% is what we call bypass protein. So 40% of the protein goes directly into the, uh, passes through to the abomasum, where it's going to be digested, uh, just like protein in a pig would be. You get into the small intestine, amino acids are absorbed into the bloodstream. All right. Well, what happens to this other 60% of the protein that's broken down? The uh, protein is going to be pro totally broken down into ammonia and then the microbes are going to combine that ammonia along with energy and make a microbial protein which is very high quality. The microbes die or the bacteria gets into the uh, abomasum where the 
acidic condition uh, kind of kills the microbes and they get digested. That microbial protein is turned into amino acids and gets absorbed into the bloodstream. All right, well, in the digestion process, we're going to get some uh, surplus ammonia created here. That gets absorbed into the bloodstream. And that makes its way over to the liver. The liver is going to convert that ammonia into urea. And then the urea goes back into the bloodstream. Surplus uh, urea is excreted through the kidneys and out with the urine. All right. And that represents a nitrogen loss here. Some urea is going to be uh, recirculated around. Uh, anyway, this is the symbol for uh, urea here. And that gets recycled through the saliva, goes back into the rumen. The microbes convert that urea into ammonia. And that can be converted into microbial protein. So the rumen, ruminant has a way of trying to conserve that uh, uh, urea and that uh, nitrogen that it takes to get as much protein out of it as possible. So we said we get urea circulating in the bloodstream here. We can also lose some of that urea if we got a lactating animal. We're going to get some urea uh, uh, excreted through the milk as well as the urine. A cautionary tale, uh, tale here is that uh, cows are vegetarians, but they do like fiber. Well, poultry are monogastrics, just like pigs are, but there are different, definitely some differences. So uh, there are no teeth, uh, so it's uh, hard for chickens to break down uh, really coarse feedstuffs. Uh, Anyway, the food moves to the back of the throat, and then we get into the crop. Now, very little digestion takes place here. The feed uh, is, uh, is uh, moistened. That kind of helps with the breakdown, but the crop is more or less just a storage area before we get into the proventriculus. The proventriculus is the true stomach, uh, just like the stomach in a pig. So we have hydrochloric acid and pepsin released there. And then we get into the gizzard. The gizzard is a very muscular organ. It may contain some grit, some stony-like material to help grind the feedstuff. So interesting thing here is rather than the teeth reducing particle size, we wait till we get into the gizzard. And from there we go into the small intestine, which uh, kind of encircles the pancreas here. We have the liver with the gallbladder. and So we got the small intestine in length. It's quite a bit smaller than what we're going to find in mammals. And so the small intestine kind of winds around. And uh, then we have the, the large intestine here, relatively small in uh, area. And depending upon the avian species, we may have a more or less uh, developed cecum. In the cecum, kind of like the cecum in a pig, uh, uh, the cecum, we can get uh, fermentation there. And in the fermentation process, we'll get uh, B, B vitamins synthesized, but also breakdown of some of the fiber into uh, volatile fatty acids that can be utilized by energy. Now, one interesting thing about chickens is we, the opening is called the vent, and it's the opening for both the urinary system as well as the, the digestive system. I guess I failed to mention on that previous slide that uh, chickens don't have any lips either. Well, here we have the horse and uh, Horses are known as hindgut fermenters. So here's where most of the digestion takes place actually after the uh, small intestine. Horses have a very small stomach. Uh, horses evolved as continuous, almost continuous eaters. So horses evolved on mostly uh, sparse uh, rangeland and they just keep moving most of the day uh, 
taking little nips here and little nips there. Horses don't uh, lay down to rest, they remain uh, standing a good part of their lives. So here's a picture of that uh, di digestive tract again. So relatively small stomach. So food stuff does not spend very much time in the sp stomach before it goes into the small intestine. And uh, then we get into the cecum, the large colon. And here's where all of the fermentation takes place here. So uh, a lot of fermentation, volatile fatty acids are produced. And they're absorbed into the bloodstream. We may have some B vitamins that are produced as well, uh, go into the bloodstream. Uh, so it's a uh, horses just evolved as continuous eaters and uh, uh, horses do not have a gallbladder. So we have bile uh, secreted more or less continuously uh, into the small intestine as well. As I said, uh, horses evolved as continuous eaters on very fibrous feed stuff. And because we uh, have domesticated a horse and we may keep them confined, our feeding uh, practice might be quite different than a horse's natural feeding practice. And for that reason, horses can be prone to uh, colic, which is just abdominal pain. And uh, it can be quite painful for the horses and even lead to death. So some signs of that, they look at their flank, they kick their belly, they're going to be restless, maybe violent, violent rolling, uh, perspiration. Obviously the horse is in distress and causes can be uh, different. Overconsumption of high uh, fiber feed, too much at once, so it can get uh, impacted. Uh, not enough water to go along with that slug of uh, dry fibrous feed. Uh, another, we can get uh, rapid uh, gas production if we feed a high starch diet that's rapidly uh, fermented uh, and you get too much uh, acid produced uh, too quickly. So how do we prevent that? Well, we need to feed a balanced ration of fiber and grain. And you only feed grain if the horse needs the extra energy, but if they're work horses, they may need the extra energy. Uh, feed in small amounts if possible. Uh, never feed grain just once a day. Feed it at least twice a day. And if you can break that in, up into four feedings, uh, that's even better. We can feed a laxative such as wheat bran just to prevent uh, the uh, feed stuffs from getting uh, stuck in the digestive tract. Founder is overconsumption of fermentable feeds such as grains or early spring grass, which is going to contain a lot of sugar. So things are fermented fast. We get lactic acid uh, built up in the blood. The lactic acid causes uh, inflammation in the feet. Uh, between the hoof wall and the sensitive uh, lamini. So you actually get uh, separation between the foot and the hoof wall. And uh, it can lead to uh, obviously a lot of pain. And you can lead to permanent uh, foot damage as this coffin bone rotates downward and can even pierce the uh, bottom of the hoof. And it can be a very permanent type uh, situation. So again, as far as be careful what you feed and uh, especially if horses aren't used to getting grain, uh, add that grain uh, gradually. Uh, store the grain away so that if a horse would get out of its pen, it's not going to find the feed sack and overconsume. Heaves is not uh, strictly a digestive uh, disorder, but it is related to the feed. So uh, he's basically an allergic reaction to the dust in the uh, feed. So the airways, uh, immune system kind of kicks in, get inflammation of the airways, uh, airways so that uh, horses have a hard time breathing. And as horses get older, they tend to have more reaction uh, 
So avoid uh, moldy feed or dusty feeds. Avoid dusty bedding. <clears throat> and if the horse uh, has a severe problem, you may need to wet the feed or feed a palleted, ra palleted ration that's not going to be dusty. Uh, rather than bed with uh, straw, bed with paper, which is going to be less dusty to prevent this uh, allergic reaction. Well, cats are uh, relatively unique. They're carnivores. They've evolved as meat eaters, and meat is high in protein. And for that reason, I guess, cats need a high-protein diet. Uh, and they need uh, fat in the diet as well. Uh, Cat diets will generally contain about 13% protein. Uh, they're not very good at conserving that protein. A lot of it is wasted, but they need it in their diet. Cats do require taurin, uh, one of the amino acids. Taurin is only found in uh, animal products. But it can be made uh, artificially and added to uh, cat diets as well. Well, is milk good or bad for cats? Cats, uh, cats love milk, I think. Uh, but definitely, uh, think of evolution. Uh, adult cats certainly didn't uh, have milk in their diets. Now, most adult cats are lactose intolerant and in that they don't produce lactase to break down the uh, disaccharide lactose into the monosaccharide uh, uh, sugars that can be utilized. But the bacteria in the lower digestive tract, they love that lactose and it's going to cause the uh, cat uh, uh, discomfort and also diarrhea. So, no, you should not feed adult cats uh, milk. In this particular illustration here, the cat is consuming uh, Yogurt and yogurt, of course, is milk that's been fermented, and the bacteria actually break down that lactose. So, yogurt completely fine to feed to cats, but you should not be feeding milk. And this is a relatively well-trained cat. So, unlike other species, cats require fat in the diet, and specifically linoleic and arconidonic uh, acids uh, it's required uh, and again you, you can only find uh, some of these uh, fats in uh, animal uh, uh, sources so uh, uh, feeding a cat a vegetarian diet is probably not the best option and preformed vitamin A must also be present in a cat's diet uh, as cats cannot break uh, beta carotene down into vitamin A so again, a preformed vitamin A only found in animal tissues. Cats definitely evolved as carnivores and not vegetarians. Cats uh, like to eat uh, numerous meals a day, so generally people uh, leave the cat food out so they can snack. Uh, but on the other hand, you have to kind of balance things because uh, one problem that house cats can have is that uh, they can become obese and overweight. So balance the nutrient density of that uh, food stuff with what the cat needs. Kind of a little interesting uh, thing here if you leave out a variety of food stuffs with different concentrations of energy, proteins, uh, cats do tend to do a pretty good job balancing their diet. Uh, as far as what they need. Now, other livestock species are not good at that. Uh, for uh, our ruminants, we can uh, give them free choice uh, salt, but other than that, it's best if we uh, give them exactly what they need in their diets. Well, uh, this cat uh, kind of made a mistake here. Well, we've got a few slides coming up here on doggy nutrition. Well, the uh, dog's uh, digestive tract, not all that much different than uh, pigs or humans, but uh, dogs tend to have some things that uh, they maybe can't consume that uh, humans consume. So definitely alcoholic beverages, not good for the dog's liver, just like humans. Uh, 
uh, chocolate, all forms of chocolate, but especially dark chocolate, I think, are, can be uh, harmful for, for the dog. So keep that out uh, of the dog's uh, reach. Uh, uh, I've never heard of uh, dogs drinking coffee, but keep that uh, away. And uh, obviously, you don't want spoiled food uh, for dogs. And Kind of et cetera, down the line, uh, some of these things, a little bit of salt in the diet's not going to hurt the dog, but uh, definitely too much salt can cause uh, problems. So, uh, what you're feeding, be relatively careful what you're feeding a dog, and probably best to have a good quality dog food, but uh, dogs uh, can eat a lot of uh, things that people eat as well and have a balanced diet. and. For a mature dog, it's relatively easy for them to get their nutrient requirements. In fact, a lot of dogs eat too much and uh, and get too uh, get too fat. <clears throat> well, Dr. Fox uh, had a syndicated column and uh, uh, that he wrote as far as uh, balancing rations for your dogs and uh, one thing that he was kind of proponent of is to uh, maybe make some uh, homemade uh, treats for your dog. So uh, dogs can eat uh, scrambled eggs and cottage cheese and little vegetables is good for dogs. And while cats evolved as carnivores, uh, carnivores, uh, dogs are really omnivores and Dogs can uh, utilize vegetables, fruits, uh, etc., as well as uh, animal food products in their diet. So this little puppy can probably utilize the lactose in that uh, ice cream fine, but again, probably not a good idea to feed milk to uh, adult dogs. And definitely best to uh, keep the dogs out of the, the refrigerator. Well, here we have just a summary on the digestive uh, types and, and relative fiber digestion. So we have our ruminants here, uh, very good at digesting fiber. Uh, horses is hind gut fermenters and rabbits also is somewhat hind gut fermenters. Uh, horses are really good. Uh, surprising rabbits, uh, not all that great. Uh, rabbits do need fiber in the diet, but if you watch rabbits in the wild, they're uh, picky eaters. They tend to like the real succulent grasses that are going to be higher in sugars, and and uh, rabbits like uh, grains. Uh, rabbits do chew on bark and stuff to uh, help their teeth from uh, getting too long. But uh, if you've got uh, a rabbit in ca captivity, realize that you can't feed a rabbit like a horse and expect them to do well. Surprisingly, uh, pigs actually digest fiber even a little better than uh, rabbits, and especially if the pig is uh, adjusted to eating a lot of fiber, that cecum can be relatively well developed. Poultry, not so great on the fiber. Now, you'll see geese eating a lot of grass, and they do, but they eat a lot, they poop a lot. They do not digest that fiber all that uh, efficiently. And humans, dogs, and cats, well, we need a little fiber in our diet to keep a healthy digestive tract, but we don't get uh, much nutrients out of that fiber. Just a little chart here on uh, weights and measures, and it's important to know these things if you're balancing rations for uh, livestock or uh, you're buying uh, foodstuffs. We're going to quickly go through a few sample uh, rations for different species and as we do this try to keep in mind what the anatomy of that animal was. So here we have a cow in early lactation. About 50 to 60 percent of the ration should be uh, High fibrous feeds, we need the corn grain for the energy, protein meal, uh, soybean meal for the protein. We may add just a pound of fat for a little extra energy. 
And then we've got the calcium and phosphorus because milk is high in calcium and phosphorus. Ground limestone for a little extra calcium, trace mineralized salt, and a uh, vitamin premix. In cows, they actually eat 51 pounds of dry matter a day. So they do eat a lot. We'll balance it for fiber, energy, protein, salt, calcium, and phosphorus, and vitamins A, D, and E. Now in young calves, the rumen is not developed yet, so we feed the young calves as uh, we would a monogastric. So liquid milk, uh, milk replacer for the first four to six weeks. We may have grain available after about a week. Here's a grain starter diet. We've got corn and oats, uh, need a little more fiber than you would a pig's diet. Soybean meal, molasses for uh, keep the dust down and uh, maybe a little flavoring agent. Then you've got our minerals and vitamins. Roughage is not needed in a calf's diet for rumen development. The, the, we've got enough fiber right in our grains here. Now pig's diet, we've got the uh, Again, just like most diets, we've got the energy source, we've got the protein source, we've got our minerals, we've got our uh, vitamins. Uh, so it's relatively easy to balance the diet for a pig. If we wean pigs uh, very early, if, let's say we wean a pig at two weeks of age, then we've got to be a lot more careful, get the amino acid balance right. We do need some animal food products in there for those uh, baby pigs, and maybe even some antibiotics to uh, keep them healthy. Poultry diets. So uh, in Minnesota, probably be corn and soybean based, little grit for the gizzard. We've got our minerals here, and especially calcium if we've got uh, hens be uh, eggs being produced. Uh, Coccidia stat uh, may or may not be uh, uh, utilized, it kind of depends, but a coccidial sat, uh, we can have problems with uh, protozoan parasites, the single cell protozoan parasite that uh, chickens are susceptible to. Laying hands, you may put alfalfa meal in there, gives a more yellow pigmentation to the yolk. In broilers, we're going to add additional fat because we want to maximize energy intake. On the sheep diet the slide here, just notice how the energy requirements uh, uh, increase if we got reproduction going on. So for maintenance, we don't need much energy, but look how much energy we need for that uh, lactating diet. Crude protein, a lot more protein after we get past the, the maintenance here. And again, if we've got a lactating animal, we better add more calcium to the diet. And if you've got a wool breed, uh, it definitely does take additional energy and protein to produce all this wool. What we're illustrating here is that uh, as young animals get older, we can actually decrease the protein concentration in the foodstuffs, uh, the protein that's needed for growth. So. This is true for sheep, as you see here, but it's also true for pigs and other growing animals as well. Really important to get a lot of protein in the diet for the youngest animals. So here's a diet for a horse, all the nutrients we need, uh, plus, uh, so notice we have a complete diet. We don't necessarily need a lot of hay in the diet. Uh, oats has quite a bit of fiber. We've got some dehydrated alfalfa here. Now, most horses are going to be fed uh, uh, hay, but it's not uh, totally necessary, I guess. Another interesting thing about horses, they only require about a 10% protein in the diet. Now, for most animals, we're going to have at least 12% protein, but horses and also llamas and alpacas, uh, require uh, relatively less protein than most other animals. Well, that includes the uh, Nutrition 6, uh, the digestive system of different animals, and concludes the uh, nutrition portion of introductory animal science. Uh, 
hope you're having a good day.